very good morning we'll go into the lectures uh, coming into the ascii pediatric neuro i am going to discuss some interesting cases rather than a pure ascii so that you can come to know about 15 to 20 cases i any kind of combination if you are there asking and ask you can answer so first we'll go into the so three year old child with altered sensorium i have given two sets of images so what are the findings what is the natural course of the disease what is the reason for selective involvement anyone from the top row any volunteer quickly so we will see more cases okay so i will read it for you there is a uh, there is a uh, ttvt hyperintense lesions it is in the bilateral symmetrical temporal lobe see bilateral symmetrical temporal region and also the frontal fibers also involved so little bit asymmetry is there so whenever you see the patient with altered sensorium 3 year old child first and foremost you have to think in terms of bilateral temporal and frontal lobe uh, diffusion restricting uh, uh, flare hyperintense lesions the diagnosis will be is a herpes say yeah. herpes encephalitis okay so what is the natural course of the disease what are the natural causes you know okay natural causes can be a complete resolution so second thing it has a hemorrhagic gliosis changes third you will have a chronic granulomatous disease so which one of the patient will turn into the chronic granulomatous disease whenever there is a immunodeficiency as a igm hyper igm situation like kind of immunodeficiency we will have a chronic granulomatous changes okay the lesion can persist for more than one year or two year also and we having the mass effect it may mimic the tumors so what is why it is involving the bilateral inferior frontal and the temporal why it is not involved in the high parietal or a occipital region so how the herpes is spreading herpes is spreading through the nasal airway so because of the proximity to the nasal airway the inferior aspect of the brain is involved first okay so that's why uh, uh, the inferior uh, frontal and temporal lobes are involved okay coming to the next case someone has to read it for me please the child with fever again i am uh, telling the child with fever okay you are telling is a basal ganglia involvement not only basal ganglia there is a thalamic also involved okay so basal ganglia and thalamic flare hyperintense lesions are there so i have given the other image in the t2 weighted coronal sections through the basal ganglia on the uh, region so you tell what is the finding you are dealing with what is the finding you are dealing with i am giving the same patient i am not giving the two patients same patients so describe the findings finding i describe so what are all the differential diagnosis we can think of he in this case there is no differential diagnosis in this case there is no differential diagnosis you have to give a final diagnosis anyone 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 apart from kmc yes it's a japanese encephalitis diagnosis is a japanese encephalitis so why i am telling the japanese encephalitis why not it's a dengue why not it's a other west nile fever or something like that so you are seeing the what is the finding uh, other finding i i i, I didn't describe is the cystic lesions see there is a so multiple cystic lesions with a central scolex so you are dealing with a neurocystic cirrhosis and the stage will be the it's a vesicular stage and it is the bilateral thalamic and uh, basal ganglia lesions so whenever you see this kind of two combinations so it is not a just a incidence it is usually a co infection why it is co infection occur okay. is there me some connecting point will be there what is the connecting point anyone decide anyone decide what is the connecting point between the japanese bee encephalitis and the yes swine yes yes speak so why what is that see we looking at the japanese bee and the neurocystic cirrhosis linkage is a pig or swine 
and see if you look at the cystic sarcosis, the tinea solin uh, is a host in a pig, whereas the pig act as an amplifier in Japanese bee encephalitis. Whenever there is more amount of piggeries, both organisms will be circled in the same community. So the patient will have Japanese bee and sorry, cystic sarcosis. So whenever there is a cystic sarcosis, the patient having a, a lesion, you can confidently tell this we are dealing with the Japanese bee encephalitis. Okay. Understood? So you go to the third question. So four day old infant, okay, four day old infant with respiratory difficulties. The sequence, so I put it, is a diffusion vector sequence through the cerebellum and the posterior internal capsule and this T1 vector sagittal and the T2 vector axial sections and I have given the spectroscopy, the spectroscopy is it's a TE 135. TE 135 spectroscopy I have given. Okay. So tell me the salient finding. Anyone? Mid side? Mid row? Okay. So salient finding will be you are seeing the posterior limb of internal capsule. There is a diffusion restriction is there. Okay. And also the four dot sign. Uh, the pons are also present and the middle cerebral peduncle also hyperintensity is there. This is the long tegmental uh, track uh, diffusion restriction. If you are looking at the uh, sagittal section, there is a minimal hypoplasia of the corpus callosum is there. And you can see there is a, uh, if you look at the posterior limb of internal capsule, it is not uh, that much uh, uh, dark here. And if you are looking at the spectroscopy, spectroscopy is a clue. So I told you what is the spectroscopy finding, anyone? Link, link, link everything, basal ganglia, basal, uh, posterior limb internal capsule and the uh, dorsal brainstem lesion and the corpus callosum lesion. So what will be the diagnosis? What will be the diagnosis? The patient is having respiratory difficulty that is a hiccup, it's a classical hiccup. See, so, so what is the peak you are seeing, 135 you are seeing, 3.7 ppm you are seeing the peak. It means you are dealing with the glycine peak. So the glycine peak, also if you 30 also it's upright. Sometimes, so you want to differentiate whether the myelinosteal peak or a glycine peak. So for that only you are doing the 135 sequence. So TE 135. If it is upright means you are dealing with, you are dealing with glycine. If it is downwards, you are not able to see the peak. Uh, if it is downwards, means most likely to be a galactose. If it is, if you are not able to see any peak here, by 3.6 ppm on the T135, it could be a myo, uh, it could be a myonostal peak. Okay, so the peak, both 35 and 135 is upright. So we are dealing with a glycine. So it's a congenital hyperglycinemia. So we call it as a glycine cleavage disorder. Okay. So other difference in diagnosis: the galactosemia and MSCD. So how it will appear? So this is the this is the case of galactosemia. So you look at the peak at the 3.6 to 3.7 ppm, there is an upright peak is there. The same thing when you are taking the TE 135, it is a reverter. So the same thing it is a 135, it is a reverter. So it is a galactose, O's, all O's will downwards on TE, uh, that is an intermediate TE, okay. It will operate on other sequence, okay. So it is a 135, if it is a downwards means it is a all O's, okay. And you can see that. Uh, this, if, if you are looking at the images, we are not able to clear, clear what we are dealing with T1 and T2. That is why the spectroscopy is diagnostic in this situation. Actually, this if you are looking at the case, that, that uh, the clinical profile will be uh, different in the case of galactosemia with the glycinemia. Galactosemia will be, patient will have the gap, congenital cat track and, and also other uh, uh, wider markers will be there. Okay. So coming to the other fourth case, anyone describe the finding? So the long segment core lesions, long segment core lesions and you are seeing the diffusion is, see the diagnosis, the diffusion is restricted. So diagnosis, long segment core lesion from here to here and there is a peripheral rim enhancement is there and the central area is the diffusion restriction. What is the diagnosis? Anyone? Anyone? So tumor? Infection? Yes. So infection means what is the cause of infection? See, look at this, this one. What is this one? This is the clue. What is this one? This is the clue. See, see, this is the dorsal dermal sinus. So, dorsal dermal sinus 
with intramillary here what we are seeing this dermoid it's an infected dermoid so infected dermoid the in, uh, infection gone up to the level of cervical mullary junction so one thing whenever you see the patient presented with meningitis not only look at the brain you have to look at the spine also sometimes dorsal dermal sinus infection can involve the brain and you will see the meningitis will be there that is a teaching point in this case okay so close differential diagnosis in this case what are the differential diagnosis for the dorsal dermal sinus so limited dorsal myelostasis we can think so here there will be there is no epithelial lined tract so you won't get any infection in the lateral uh, limited dorsal myelostasis okay so child with deafness actually this is a spotter i put it in a husky so that i can split into three what is the finding what is the name of the sign what is the diagnosis so i have given as a clue as a deafness so you can give a diagnosis so single single disease there is no multiple differential diagnosis in this location so what you are seeing is there is a findings the correct nucleus involvement with the atrophy is there the anterior aspect of the putamen involvement with the horizontal line it's a demarcation between the normal and abnormal there is a upper areas uh, only involved the lower uh, do, do, dorsal aspect is spare so uh, this sign is called putaminal eye so putaminal eye sign so whenever you see the putaminal eye sign okay so it's a kind so whenever you see like this kind of linear uh, demarcation in the putamen with a t2 hyper intensity diffusion restriction you can think of always mitochondrial so if you see the horizontal differentiation in the putamen okay so anterior involvement you can call it as a putaminal eye okay diagnosis will be the since i have given deafness this is a, a diagnosis of middel so what is middel three methyl glutaconic aciduria and deafness encephalopathy and lee leg syndrome okay this is a case of megdal the sign you are seeing is the putaminal eye okay describe the findings diagnosis and tell me the syndrome tell me the syndrome so always you have to be with that on the line of clinician side okay you always think in terms of clinicians you are, all, you, are you are a clinical radiologist that's why what is the syndrome associated with this what is the finding so sudden onset a 19 year old uh, in fact uh, 19 year old guy what is the findings look at the findings see the loss of flow void in the vertebral artery so whenever you have to see the vertebral both side there is a loss of flow void is there so it means that there is a thrombus in the vertebral artery the same side you are seeing the vertebral cord is showing the hyper intensity so it means that vertebral artery dissection okay diagnosis spinal cord infarcts syndrome associated since it is involved the one hemi orthox so syndrome is is a brown sacar syndrome okay so coming to the next case the two day old infant with seizures okay describe the finding anyone in the last bench okay so i read it reading for you there is a uh, hypertens uh, collections that is a hemorrhage uh, just outside the cortical cortex of the frontal region and also dipping into the sulcus this is dipping into the sulcus that is very important and apart from this you are seeing there is a another hemorrhage in the inner side of the cortex so what is the diagnosis this is intraaxial extraaxial anyone this is intraaxial extraaxial extraaxial wrong okay so complication that's why i have put it say intraaxial extraaxial so usually i won't put like this uh, complications what is the prognosis how it heal how it heal 
whether it is completely resolved. Okay. So the diagnosis is, is a sub pile hemorrhage. So diagnosis is a sub pile hemorrhage. So sub pile hemorrhage. This is a intra axial hemorrhage. It is not a extra axial hemorrhage. Okay. This is a intra axial bleed. So extra axial is know that subdural or extra extra dural is the extra axial. The sub pile is the it's a intra axial bleed. So since it is intra axial bleed, it is compressing the veins. It will produce the uh, blockage of the venous, and you will have the venous impact on the other side. You will see the hemorrhage in the inner aspect. So sub pile hemorrhage with intra uh, parenchymal bleed. So it always heals with the gliosis. It means that see there is a here if you see any hemorrhage is the sub pile hemorrhage is there. It will compress the veins because of the venous compression. It will produce the hemorrhages in this area. Okay. Coming to the next case, the so 26-year-old male presenting with seizure. Anyone? So I will give that this is the clue. This is the image. This is the image of diagnosis. With this image and this image, you compare. You will give the diagnosis. Only one diagnosis. Which one? Anyone? Tell me. See, look at this. There is a soft tissue defect in the skin and subcutaneous pain. And looking at this, you are seeing the ipsilateral areas of multiple areas of hemorrhages and surrounding ischemia are there. Multiple areas of hemorrhages surrounding ischemia and there is a ipsilateral uh, ip, uh, uh, skin loss. The diagnosis, uh, radiological finding we described, clinical finding we have told us there is a skin loss, we can call this alopecia, uh, clinical finding, diagnosis will be there. Anyone? Diagnosis? See, look at that, there is a, so in looking at this case, see, there is a linear morphia is there, okay, this is a case of Pari Rambach syndrome. It is a Pari Rambach syndrome. Again, it is a, a spot diagnosis and you can see the ipsilateral uh, skin loss and ipsilateral hemorrhages and uh, there is a uh, periventricular, uh, there is a ischemic changes, okay. So, for, if this is a linear scleroderma or morphia like conditions, okay. Okay. So, coming to this uh, next case, you can tell me the times, okay. Uh, coming to the next case. So you have seen the TT weighted imaging, the diffusion weighted imaging. So then come to the findings. What is the spot the sign here? Okay. What is the sign? What is the sign? Huh? Donut sign. So donut or trilaminar sign. Okay. So donut or trilaminar sign. What is the diagnosis? It's acute necrotizing encephalopathy. Okay. What is the causative organisms? So it could be anything. It could be a, a it is described in influenza or para influenza mycoplasma infection. Now recently we are attributing into the dengue. Okay. Okay, trilaminar sign, it's a acute necrotis encephalitis and it's a influenza uh, mycoplasma herpes and uh, human herpes six virus also associated. But the classical finding will be there. You can see the central areas of necrosis, okay. And you can see that this, this is the central areas of necrosis which appears due to hyperintensity. And the peripheral and the second rim will lead a diffusion restricting layer. And apart from the diffusion restriction, there is a, a non diffusion restricting due to hyperintensity. That says a trilaminar sign, central hemorrhage. Next will be the diffusion restriction layer. Next will be the vasogenic edema, which is not diffusion restriction. So classic law, acute necrotizing encephalitis. Okay. Okay, coming to the next case. Anyone back punches? So what is the abnormalities in spectroscopy? What is the diagnosis? So creatinine peak is not that. So you are dealing with creatinine deficiency. What are the creatinine deficiencies? Uh, there are many syndromes are there. Okay, 
reaction in deficiency syndrome if you uh, tell that is more than enough first thing you have so whenever you see the thing the spectroscopy you have to see what are the normal peaks are visualized or not first you have to see whether there is a uh, NA peak is there or a creatinine peak is there choline is there creat2 peak is present or not here if you see the only two peaks are there the creatinine peak is not there and you have to see whether there is these peaks are abnormally placed whether the NA is elevated NA is down so usually you have to look at the creatine so you, uh, if it is adult or basal ganglia if it is more than one and a half times of the creatine NA will be there and the choline will be as equal to that of uh, creatinine or less than that of the uh, creatinine in a normal whereas in a uh, pediatric patient with an infant or a, in a newborns you will have the choline peak will be elevated more than that of the creatinine peak okay that is a normal one so it's a congenital creatine deficiency syndrome okay so whenever you see the spectroscopy many times you can uh, use an exact diagnosis this case again the, uh, there is a brain stem involvement and you can see the uh, thalamus and the posterior limb of internal capsule and uh, posterior uh, putaminal fibers are involved either, and the periventricular right matter is also minimally involved the middle cerebral peduncle also involved by looking at the spectroscopy you are seeing that branched chain amino acid peaks at the 0.9 ppm so whenever you see the branched chain amino acid peaking in the 0.9 ppm so your diagnosis is almost certain that you are dealing with a maple syrup urine disease none other disease so the same thing you can see there is a periventricular white matter hyper intensity and if you looking at the spectroscopy uh, if you looking at the peak at the level of 7.7 .7 ppm so usually you won't see the 7.5 you have to extend the peak when you are suspecting penile kidneyuria see in this case uh, you can see that there is a periventricular hyper intensity there is a peak at the level of 7.5 ppm so we are dealing with a hyperplanemia or a penile kidney disease in this case okay and you can see there is a uh, white matter lesions and there is a skin uh, thickening is there if you are looking at the spectroscopy so think the marked peak at the uh, 1.2 ppm or uh, it says a lipid peak whenever you see the strongest lipid peak if the same kind of di uh, pattern your diagnosis will be only one there is a long chain fatty acid disease the jogren larsen disease and also you can see there is a corpus callosal thinning and the corpus callosal thinning you can see the na is more than that of the two times of the creatinine the more elevated the na it's a case of sallas disease you can have a elevated uh, na peak will be there and you can see other disease like a, uh, um, there is a uh, globus pallidus and the periventricular right matter entire cerebrum involvement you can see the uh, na peak will be more than three times that of the creatinine peak you are dealing with the canavans disease so whenever you see the uh, spectroscopy uh, we can give uh, confident diagnosis in some of the cases like this okay so this kind of cases will be uh, put in spotter or ask whatever it may be so for uh, for for compiling so if you looking at the 2 ppm the canavan uh, elevated peak with the canavan disease if you looking at this 0.9 ppm branched chain amino acid you will see in the msvd if you looking at uh, l2 hydroxy glutaric asteria in 3.4 ppm will have the uh, the l2 hydroxy glutaric asteria if you looking at 3 ppm equal to the creatinine it will reduce in creatinine deficiency in 3.5 ppm you will see the non ketotic hyperglycemia whereas the 3.7 ppm will be the galactosemia whereas in 7.6 ppm you will see the pineal ketonuria okay so coming to the next uh, next arena so coming we were moving into the newborn so what is the newborn uh, what is the finding what is the next line of investigation what is the advice you will give to the patient and the patient attendant patient with lethargy if you are doing the ct scan so what is the, the, the diagnosis what is the finding in this uh, ct hypodense venous sinuses so diagnosis will be the next line of investigation mr vinagre what will give the advice to the patient in the case what is the uh, advice you will give to the patient at under hydration okay so uh, the, we looking at this here see see here there is a, a two uh, brain with the same kind of finding forget about this calcification so both are having the hyperdense the only difference will be here the myelination is it's uh, incomplete here the myelination is complete so you are dealing with a newborn here you are dealing with a pediatric patient so next you will see the you will give the mr venogram mr venogram is absolutely normal 
So here the uh, because why it is due to newborn seeing of the high gametophyte. Okay, and we will see that there is a thrombus will be there. The are uh, the same patients in the pediatric patient there is a peripheral enlarging lesions. Uh, the empty delta sign uh, uh, you will have the thrombus is there. Okay, so, so the hypertension sinus if you can reassure the patient when there is no hypernatremia or something any dehydration is not there. So normally newborn will have high hematocrit. If you do the CT for any other looking uh, reasons, you will get the hypertension sinus. Unless you suspect the venous sinus thrombosis only, you can uh, do that MR venogram. But otherwise, you can observe the patient. You can reassure the patient. It is a normal thing. Okay. Okay. Final question. So four day old infant encephalopathy. Abgar is three by ten. What is the finding? Where will you look at the finding in a term baby? Why are the characteristic finding? Where is the characteristic finding you will look at? So plic. So plic is a posterior limb of internal capsule. So posterior limb of internal capsule, it should be myelinated, it should be appears bright. Whereas here, the, uh, you are not seeing any T1 bright here. And also T2 dot is also little bit reduced. And you can see the diffusion, there is a diffusion restriction is there. So the loss of T1 hyperintensity and the severe, uh, the diagnosis will be that severe brief hypoxic ischemic insult. Severe brief hypoxic ischemic insult and the differential diagnosis will be that uh, hypoglycemia, parathyroidism, malignant cofactor deficiency. So to differentiate uh, preterm HIE versus uh, term HIE, the preterm HIE involves the uh, periventricular region. Why uh, it is that you are dealing with uh, germinal matrix uh, it's around the periventricular region. Whereas uh, uh, here, here is the border in uh, lesion, whereas in term infants, the border zone will be in between the MCA and ACA water is that that's why this region will be involved in a case of uh, term whereas the periventricular environment will be seen in the preterm. See there is a normal you will see the posterior limb of internal capsule is uh, uh, bright here whereas abnormal you will see the, the T1 which is hypertensive is lost in the severe HIE. Okay. Okay. So HIE whenever you suspect HIE we have to do that. Spectroscopy, there is already I told T30 and 135, T30 will be elected will be up, up, upright, whereas the T135 all those will be downwards, here the same thing downwards, so that is, is your differentiating lipid from the lactate here, okay, okay, and preterm you will see the periventricular hemorrhages will be there, and based on this uh, severity we can uh, classify the HIE, it is a bind to moderate, Gradual or the moderate prolonged intermittent, severe brief or the severe prolonged. So it means that mild to moderate only the cerebral white matter is involved and prolonged you will see the cerebral uh, white matter along with the minimal amount of deep gray matter nucleus whereas the severe brief will be the deep gray matter nucleus and the brainstem and the cerebral cortex are relatively spared. The severe prolonged everything is involved. See here there is a mild, you can see the only the periventricular white matter fibers are involved. And you can see the peri, uh, periventricular white matter and, the, uh, and also minimal areas of basal ganglia environment is there and the cortex also involved. And relatively rest of the central areas of thalamus and the uh, basal ganglia is relatively preserved. It is a severe, uh, it is a prolonged insult, moderate prolonged insult and the acute severe. It is a kind of abruption you are immediately intervening. So posterior limb of internal capsule is involved and the uh, uh, ventrolateral thalamus and the posterior putamen is involved. So the severe means you can see the cortex or the basal ganglia and also the brain semi So with this I conclude. Thank you for giving me the opportunity.